Europa. I have a grandson who is seven years old, living in Australia, and uh, he was uh, congratulating me to my birthday. And she said, she says, Opa, how old are you? I said, 74. I said, 74? And then he was uh, kind of mulling it over in his head for a while, I guess trying to add it up in his uh, year uh, grade one calculus, and then he turns around and says, uh, and did you start from one? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happens to you if you start from one and live as long as I do. Well, uh, I'm a scientist, and uh, I, I personally, I grew up in a situation, an area where politics was so dangerous that I don't want to have anything to do with the politics. I'm going to do just science. So, uh, so uh, what I'm going to, to show you that it's not really that what, what has been told that it's all nonsense. It's a good science, but it's not the only science. <coughs> And the, the rest, uh, the, uh, there is political pressure to shut down any, any other side only, the one which is by IPCC. So, um, you know, already in the third century BC, BC, Aristarchus of Samos proposed a model where the Earth was orbiting the Sun. Yet the zeitgeist, of the times, which was probably essential for uh, the stability of the society, dictated that the Earth was the center of the universe with a symphony of uh, uh, spheres as its structure. When observation showed that the stars and, uh, were at times moving even backwards in their trajectories, so the model was fixed, fixed with an ever more spheres called epicycles to account for such irregularities. In terms of their mathematics and physics, these were sophisticated models uh, with some predictive capabilities, providing that the underlying assumption that the sun orbits the Earth is unquestionably accepted. Any questioning of this taboo was a heresy to be punished, sometimes with life. It took some 2,000 years for the humanity to accept that it was the Earth orbiting the Sun, not the other way around. Hence, the sophisticated construction of epicycles was irrelevant to reality. I believe that we are now in somewhat analogous time in history. Our guilt complex resonates in its zeitgeist, where CO2 drives the climate. Our sophisticated, and they are sophisticated, climate models are good science, providing that the fundamental assumption that it is a CO2 that is the principal climate driver is accepted as a fact and not questioned. Uh, any suggestion that it may be the other way around is a heresy to be silenced by any means. So based, I'm going to put based on solely an empirical data going to argue for such a heresy. All that I hope, hope for is an open mind from the other courses from you. Uh, I do not expect this presentation to have any impact at all on Paris agenda because its goals many in fact even desirable, like decreasing pollution, okay? Whereas our political, economic and social, not the verity of science. At the same time, I do not anticipate that the outcome of, this, of the Paris meeting will have much impact, if any, on future climate. Not because the proposed reductions in carbon output may not go far enough, but because the proposed scenario may be irrelevant if it, is, uh, 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 if it turns out that the climate controls the carbon cycle and not the other way around as it is in the models. You generally think that, we are, that all these, uh, those models are about CO2. In fact, they are not about CO2. Cl our climate debate is not really about carbon dioxide, 
at about so-called one pod watts discrepancy in a poorly no planetary energy balance. What's 1.6 1 watts, uh, watts? It's a bulb, like a bicycle bulb, bulb. So there is so much less energy going up into the space than coming in. Now, what is really telling you uh, is uh, that we know the balance of the planetary Earth, of the planet, the energy balance of the planet, to a precision of 0.1%. Now, I make a, a question here. How many of you do know your bank account to that decision? Raise your hands. Okay, I think I make my point. Okay? So this is the first point. So, but let's accept it. Let's go next, let's go forward. So, we have a natural greenhouse on this planet, which is something like 33 degrees C. If it fell for this greenhouse, then this planet would be totally frozen. So what we are talking about, the so-called anthropogeny, is that red line over there of that greenhouse. Okay? So this is this is by nature. This is there. By 33 degrees C. This is what makes the temperature average temperature about 15 degrees C. Otherwise it would be frozen. So but where is this temperature coming from in the models? In fact, but IPCC, uh, two-thirds by others, practically all of the temperature is not really from the greenhouse effect from, uh, of uh, CO2, it's from the greenhouse effect of water vapor. So greenhouse gas number one is water vapor, greenhouse gas number two is water vapor, greenhouse gas number three is water vapor, greenhouse gas number four is water vapor. And only then comes CO2 and anything else. Okay. So, uh, the point is, therefore, the water is by far the most important greenhouse gas, and it is likely that via water cycle the climate is being, climate is being modulated. The point also is that if you put energy into the water cycle, when you drive it faster, you generate more greenhouse. Okay? So, putting energy into water cycle will generate uh, generate warmer and, uh, and uh, 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 better climate regardless of where this uh, energy is coming from. Okay? To water cycle it doesn't even know that it's coming from CO2. To water cycle it is all energy. Okay? So you put energy into water cycle, you get your greenhouse, you get your temperature. So the point is really where is that energy coming from? Well. The, the <coughs> most logical thing would be that you do it, that you, co uh, it's coming from the sun. The sun is putting energy into water cycle, that generates the greenhouse. The, uh, uh, then uh, that, in turn, that genera generates the climate, and the climate decides how much jungle, how much uh, uh, tundra, how much whatever you will, uh, you will uh, on this planet. Yes. Then you have a feedback back from the uh, from uh, the jungle or whatever on CO2 and others. So there is some feedback, but the major part this is how it uh, how it could work. Sun drives the water cycle, so the sun is a source of energy. Water cycle is the uh, is the uh, uh, transport mechanism which distributes all this energy all across the planet, and all the other things are essentially hanging on this water cycle not driving, hanging. Well, okay, but what, then what uh, the uh, IPCC says, but it cannot be the sun. It cannot be the sun because we have measurements of satellites since about 78, and there were many satellites, you see, the, and you have to put up together all these <coughs> measurements from satellites to get 30 years of data, and look how much do you have to shift that? 10, 15 watts. Okay? And so, and then you get uh, this uh, record. And uh, so, the uh, people who, uh, who, who well, uh, the, the people who measured it in satellite, they say, oh, it was slightly increasing. People who model it, they say it was slightly decreasing, or it wasn't any. But the point which we are uh, uh, trying to make is, that 
the cost, the, the sun the, doesn't change. It's, sta it's stable. Well, 1.6 watts in here is just a noise. Okay? You already shifted it by 10, 10 watts. Okay? So they say because the, uh, the uh, sun is not changing, it cannot be the cause of those variations in climate. <coughs> so we can forget about the sun. Okay, at least on the time scale of years or maybe decades or maybe a century. Okay. Some, uh, so if you can forget it, then you, okay, so uh, essentially you say sun, sun is a constant, so we don't have to bother about that. And so, since the sun is a, a constant, there might be uh, something else, and that something else is uh, the energy from the carbon cycle, from CO2, from the greenhouse of CO2. So now it is this CO2 from which you put some energy into the water cycle, and that creates the climate and so on. So this is the way you generate uh, uh, claim that CO2 is uh, the, the cause because we don't know anything else, and it's some cannot it be. So there is not a proof it should be CO2 because. We have the so-called measurements of the temperature. So these are let's say temperature is blue. So we and in fact what we had is so we had a cooling. Then in the early uh, part of the uh, of the century warming. Then in the 60s, 40s to 60s we had practically nothing. Then we had again uh, warming, and then of course since 19 we have again nothing. Okay, so this, uh, the uh, conclusion is, well, CO2 incre uh, increase, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, CO uh, temperature increased from 8 degrees over the century, CO2 increased from 2 to 80 to about 350 or 360 parts per million, therefore there is an increase, there is a correlation. But there is not a correlation, they both increased. In fact, you know, we used to have a... Uh, mm, Christmas parties, uh, we have a Christmas party in the department where perhaps students and prof make fun of, uh, of each other and it's uh, fun. And uh, once uh, a colleague came in and made a very complicated curl. And this is, you know, this is the uh, seawater evolution according to Jan Weiser. And these are his constraining points. Okay, so that's an kind of argument. In fact, if you look at CO2, CO2 increased exponentially. And it really didn't do anything, shouldn't do anything even uh, uh, with the models until about 1960s or 70s. Okay? Because it was too little of it. Okay? Even in the models. And so there is no real correlation. They just go up. That's all. There is actually much better correlation, and you it's <coughs> important. In this red line, which is a kind of a measure of the magnet electromagnetic uh, field around the Earth. So remember that. Okay? The, the red line. That's much, much better correlation. So, uh, so, which one is it? Is it sun or carbon dioxide? Do we have any empirical evidence? Well, we have the measurements of CO2 in ice cores and, uh, uh, and the actual measurements. But we also have a measure of the sun. How do we know the measure of the sun? Well, you know, there is something, we, have, we are part of the solar system. So in the solar system we have the sun, but around the solar system there is a huge electromagnetic field called the heliosphere. And around the Earth called magnetosphere. And this is this huge electromagnetic field. This is, for example, what makes uh, aurora borealis when it starts heating. You know? So this is our shield. If we didn't have this, we would be fried. Okay? This shields us against cosmic rays or solar rays. Too. So when the sun is strong, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Deflection of cosmic rays, or the shield is very strong, deflects those cosmic rays away. Okay? When the sun is weak, then the. Uh, uh, so, when this uh, is deflected. When the sun is weak, the shield shrinks, many more cosmic rays pass through. Okay? And that this is not a story. Uh, you can see it here. So, the red one is the. Uh, 
the sun's uh, uh, alpha, this is the intensity of the sun, okay? And the stronger the sun, the less cosmic rays measured. Okay, heating uh, falling on the Earth. So this is not a story. However, at the same time, when those cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, they they uh, uh, hit the, uh, the uh, nitrogen and oxygen, they generate, well, I don't know, it's probably easier to do this, uh, they generate lots of what we call cosmogenic nuclei, so carbon-40, that kind of rains down on the Earth, and we can measure it. So when the sun was weak, we have lots of carbon-40. Okay? Now, so let's take an example. i show you one example. This is a cave. In the cave, we have something called stalagmites. Stalagmites have growth rings, like, like trees. So we can date them, those growth rings, what, what years, and we can measure uh, oxygen isotopes uh, in it, which is a measure of temperature. So we get a temperature record over those years when the stalagmite grows. So I'll show you an example of a, uh, of a uh, stalagmite from cave in the Alps. And so you see the uh, blue curve, this is temperature. So temperature when it was very high. Well, does it show temperature? It does show temperature because, for example, from about 1950 to about 1350, we had the so-called medieval optimum, which it was quite warm, probably warmer than today. Well, was it warm? Of course it was. This was the time when uh, uh, Vikings came to America, when Greenland was green. Okay? So this was warm. Afterwards, from uh, afterwards, until about 1850, we had very cold times. It was called a little ice age. Was it cold? Yes, of course it was, because we know it. We have many, more, many pictures of you are being frozen and being uh, pestilence and all that stuff. Okay, so we have that curve. So th this is uh, climate curve, and what when we then we compare it and we see what, what does it correlate for. So the blue was that climate curve, which I'll show you. The the uh, red is the carbon fourteen. Loads of carbon-14, cold, remember? So, and CO2, CO2 was just flat at what we call pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million. In fact, we know from the ice core that this was the level of 285 parts per million for 10,000 years back. And climate changed quite a lot. Before that, if you go into geological past, 80% of the time, CO2 was much higher than today. Five times, 10 times as much, 80%. And we had ice ages at the times when, when the CO2 was 10, 15 times as much. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have time to write that. What about the last uh, 100 years? This, this increase in carbon-14 and uh, increase in CO2, which probably mostly is anthropogenic, okay? Well, we cannot do much there because uh, the atomic bombs destroy the record for carbon-14. Okay, so for the last 100 years, we cannot use it. But we have direct measurements. So, but you can say, well, but Mr. Gore showed this picture in the ice cores where there is this very famous correlation of ice ages in the uh, uh, well, uh, warm, uh, cold, warm, cold, about, about every 100,000 uh, years, and CO2, no? It usually the proof. Well, this is how you, uh, you know, the, the movie, which was called uh, 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 Unpleasant, no, uh, uh, Inconvenient, Inconvenient Truths, yeah. okay? which was called inconvenience rules. So uh, he, what he said, he, he came in and he said, see the correlation? He didn't say the second half of it, and he knew it. It was known at that time. So he let you jump to the conclusion. Because if he did, so let's look in detail, for example, this one, 
uh, this one uh, warming up from an ice age 150,000 years ago. When you look at the details, what, what do you see? That first, it was temperature change, uh, change and then carbon dioxide rose. So temperature changes, then carbon dioxide. That would turn out this argument upside down. So from the inconvenient truth, uh, well, conven con convenient half truths became inconvenient truths. Okay? So, and this is not only on this time scale, but it is also over the last hundred years. What you see here, these are temperature variations over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Variation about the differences from one year to the next one. Okay? Not the actual uh, temperature, but the difference <coughs> from one year to the next one. So you have warmer, colder years, and uh, uh, this is this is the curve. And you, of course, have a, have a uh, correlation with CO2. But look again, every single time that peak in CO2 follows the increased temperature, but after. Okay. So then, who is driving who? It's the climate driving the CO2. So, uh, is, the is the tiny carbon cycle driving the huge water cycle, which in fact then generates it because it says, okay, it uh, uh, drives the water cycle, and water cycle starts turning around and making it more and more uh, warmer and so on. This is called water, uh, it, uh, this is called. Uh, uh, Amplification. So by that, on because if you calculate CO2 is a greenhouse, it is, it is a greenhouse gas. But if you calculate actual CO2, how much you, temperature you would get? Probably half a degree for so-called doubling. Okay. So this is the way you get the three or three and a half degree or four degrees they want because it really they say oh it just pushes into the water cycle and water cycle multiplies it by three four times. It's really coming from the water cycle. Okay. So this is this is how it's done. So you need this amplification uh, in, in the water cycle. So uh, let's look therefore at the actual carbon cycle itself. So you have carbon cycle. So we have that much carbon in the atmosphere in those units. Okay. Now this much. CO2 is not a pollutant. CO2 is a base of the food chain. This is what plants are breathing. <coughs> this is what we eat. Okay? This is basis of life. So uh, uh, carbon cycle is essentially a biological cycle. And where does it go most? Into photosynthesis and then respiration back. So the amount is about this much. So every four or five years, we actually uh, drive the entire equivalent of the whole atmospheric CO2 via the biosphere. Okay. This is really the very dominant thing. It's a biosphere. Okay, the five six years, similar situation is in the oceans. So let's look a bit on the details how this happens. This, this is photosynthesis respiration. <coughs> now. Where do we have most photosynthesis? You know, we are supposed to plant trees to lower the CO2. Okay. Where do we get most, most photosynthesis? Well, the jungles. That's where most uh, trees are, most, most photosynthesis. So let's look what drives photosynthesis. When you look at the, uh, the situation in Amazon, so uh, for example, what you see here, the uh, uh, red is solar variation, and green is uh, leaf area at the measure of photosynthesis. So it's clear it's the sun driving the photosynthesis. And in fact, you see that most of the photosynthesis is in the dry period, not in the wet period here. Why? Because there is, more, uh, there is uh, no clouds. Okay, therefore more energy, more sun, more photosynthesis. Okay. Not, not water is important, but uh, so what happens during photosynthesis? 
Well, we were supposed to translate this to lower the CO2. In the photosynthesis, well, for every single molecule of CO2 that is taken into the plant, the plant has to transpire back into the atmosphere. Thousand molecules of water. One to thousand. Okay. Now, half of the whole energy from the, uh, which comes from the sun on land is used in photosynthesis. But the plant actually uses only about 6% of that. So where is this uh, missing 42% going on of the energy? Well, you need it to drive the water. So the plants, it's not the photosynthesis itself. So the plants invented uh, uh, capillaries, which enabled the water to go easier up into the atmosphere, which saved some 8% in the energy, which is now used by, by plants uh, for photosynthesis. So this conveyor belt, it's needed, because what it does is water cycle going on constantly, where you need all the energy. This is what brings you the food, nutrients. Okay. So you need this conveyor belt to bring you the food. It, whether there will be a, a famine in, in Ethiopia, it doesn't matter the, how quickly or slowly you eat, but how good your distribution system is. Okay. So really, what we are seeing, that the water and carbon cycles are co-driven by solar energy, but it is the existence of water conveyor belt that is a precondition for it all. Okay. So everything else is just piggybacking on this energy conveyor belt of the water cycle. Every other carbon cycle, every other cycle. Okay, every other cycle. Uh, and it's simple. If you have no conveyor belt, you have no food, no food, no life, no life, no carbon cycle. And even in, in inorganic groups, it's the same. If you have no uh, uh, water, uh, then there will be no weathering, no erosion, no deposition, no nothing. If you have no CO2, everything will go on, except some reactions will be different. So water is the most important thing. So when you look at it now, when you, when you look at the amount of CO2 taken from the atmosphere per year, this is, this is this, this pattern here. So you see that there is a connection, the 1,000 to 1. These points are the, uh, the water amount. In, well, this is, this is the amount of rain. So for example, in, in uh, Papua New Guinea, which are this data, there is eight meters of rain per year, and this is the amount of photo, amount of uh, either water involved in photosynthesis, or the amount of carbon involved in photosynthesis, which is this point, which is this is actually measured. So, and the ratio between these two is clearly thousand to one here. But look at it like this: when you go in high latitudes, so. Clearly, there is a water uh, shortage, and uh, the, the two things are coupled. But once you come to the tropics, where most of the photosynthesis happens, it's at the plateau. Why is it? And, and you have plenty of water, but it doesn't go anymore. Why? Because the system works at its maximum capacity with respect to incoming solar radiation. Okay? So it's about 6, 7, 8%. Okay? If you want to have more sequestration or whatever, more photosynthesis, you have to get more solar radiation. That will increase your plateau. Okay? So if you have more input, more solar, solar input on it, so the, you will get more, photo, more incoming solar radiation. There will be more photosynthesis. So the plateau will move up. At the same time, because you will have more evaporation in the oceans, there will be more rain. It will be better. At the same time, because you produce more vapor, water vapor, you uh, push more water vapor towards the poles. This is where it's coming from, from the tropics. Okay? So the whole picture, when you have increased solar activity, the whole picture moves to up and uh, to the right. When the sun is weaker, the whole picture moves down and to the left. So 
you, the sun is stronger, there is more CO2, there is better and warmer, and there is more CO2, not less CO2. <laughs> but there is no, because there will be more photosynthesis and then uh, more respiration, so the whole thing will go high and back. And so it oscillates in, with respect to the sun. This is how the system probably works. Now, you know, this, uh, so if this is a situation, so it looks, it looks like we are dealing with this situation. Sun drives the water cycle, water cycle makes the greenhouse, the greenhouse uh, they generate the climate, climate generates our ecosystems. Okay? So like this, and not the other way around. There is some impact of other way around, but it's, it's, it's secondary. Okay? So how could it work in the, if then CO2 is not the, uh, the, the climate driving thing? What, <coughs> what could it be? Well, maybe it's still those cosmic rays. That's one possibility. It doesn't have to be, but it's about why. Because when cosmic rays hit that, that uh, electromagnetic field, which is lots of particles, electricity, and so on, what whatever processes, it generates uh, small nuclides. Nu uh, nuclides. You see, this is the cosmic rays intensity, and this is the amount of nuclides generated. This is measured. This is experimentally proven. Now, uh, why are the nuclides important? Because nuclides are important for rain, for drops. It doesn't rain because you have supersaturation water. You have to seed it. Like this is why the Chinese were shooting into the, into the uh, clouds before the Olympics to make rain. Okay? You have to seed it. So these may serve as nuclides for making droplets, make, making clouds. Okay? Now, up to this stage, the problem at this stage is how do you make from those very tiny, uh, uh, tiny uh, uh, nuclides, bigger ones, uh, for the, uh, for this is not, as, at this, this moment we don't know that. But this file goes, okay? Then if you make uh, clouds, well, this is something like, you know, probably you, you remember from, sc from school the, uh, uh, the uh, gas chamber. When the particle comes, suddenly you get a uh, line or whatever. It, this is condensation. This is exactly the same process. Okay, so when you make clouds, clouds have, and uh, it's complicated, but they can serve as a, as a mirror reflecting the energy solar rays back into the space. And that's a big mirror. In fact, the measurements in energy difference between cloudy and cloudless sky is 30 watts. No? We were talking about 1.6 watts. So what do you need? You change clouds by 1-2% and you have your 1.6 watts if you want them. In other words, what I'm saying, when it's cloudy, it's cold, when it's uh, uh, sunny, it's, uh, it's warm. By generation of clouds, this would be one of the ways you could do it. It's, uh, there may be other ways. We don't know it yet. And it may not be even true, but what I'm trying to tell you that there were data which are being disputed now that there is a correlation between cloud amount and uh, cosmic ray flux. Okay? So if it's, if it's proven, it's disputed at this stage, but there are some data indicating that. So this may be the situation. So what we have. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the, how do I, okay. we have a mm, mm, orchestra of nature. I did every orchestra. We have a conductor, which is a sun. We have a first fiddle, which is a water cycle, and we have a second fiddle, which is a carbon cycle. Like in every orchestra. The role of the second fiddle is to follow the first fiddle, not to overplay it, and certainly not to take over from the conductor. And even if it tried, it would be kicked out of the orchestra. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is, 
that maybe IPCC is right or maybe not. There are other things, there are other possibilities which are being silenced at this stage and not discussed. So that doesn't mean you go and pollute, that doesn't mean that, for example, the, uh, uh, the CO2 uh, uh, well, uh, uh, not sequestration, but uh, lowering the CO2 emissions can be used, or CO2 emissions can be used as a measure of pollution if you want to. Not pollution itself, but measure of pollution, because uh, uh, industrial activity will generate CO2. Okay? So if you use it that way, fine. But argue that way. In other words, argue scientific arguments by scientific arguments and political arguments by political arguments. If many of the things which, you, which are wanted by, uh, by, Pari by Paris, like uh, uh, in terms of environment, may be correct. Okay? But uh, be reasonable. It, don't just bulldoze it through. That's, that's my point. And I may be wrong, but to me, this alternative is as good as the IPCC. In fact, it has probably more empirical supporting data than the IPCC points. And, and uh, the, the whole thing is, it's not that like the models are manipulated or crazy, whatever. They are as good as they can be, providing you accept the first assumption, CO2 driving. No discussion. Okay? It's like the, the uh, heliocentric and uh, geocentric universe which was there for 2000 years. Thanks. <laughs> Politically, it will go through, I have no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will have huge repercussions for the uh, future economical decisions, for sure. And I'm not going, I told you, some of the things are really okay. What I'm personally disputing is science should be scientifically discussed. And both sides present it. And not shutting out and not allowing people to talk and to, uh, to give them our conferences and so on because the science is sacred. Science is not sacred. And in, in fact, it's, uh, but why is it? Well, this is, the, this is the German word, zeitgeist, the feelings of times. When the feelings of times are like that the, sun, uh, that the Earth was the center of the universe and it was important for the society, there was nothing that was going to come in time. At the moment, we have this uh, uh, feeling of uh, us being a disaster, uh, the guilt complex, so, again, and you probably cannot stop it. It has to run its course, and either it, it, it's shown to be right or it will discredit itself. It's like the, the communist system, okay? It discredited itself, collapsed, but it took a long time. Can I uh, yeah. say something here, yeah. Bob? Yeah, I was going to hear from Mike, uh, and also maybe Dan has something to say. Yeah, yeah. We both will. I, I, um, I totally agree with Dr. Weiser that this is the zeitgeist. Where I would somewhat disagree is that it has to run its course on its own. The problem, the reason it's the zeitgeist, or another word for that is popular opinion. Why is popular opinion following these absolutely insane policies, uh, which are scientifically fraudulent? Well, it has to do with the general collapse of our society. Uh, you, you have to look at the entirety of a societal breakdown that's taken place approximately since the time that John F. Kennedy was killed. The country was sucked into the Vietnam War, a, a colonial war that America should have had nothing to do with, which John F. Kennedy, in fact, was intent on not fighting. John Kennedy had made clear he was going to pull the advisors out and he was not going to deploy troops to Vietnam. Uh, he was killed. 
and uh, Johnson was weak and got sucked into this horrendous war, which was the beginning of the decline of America. But at the same time, we saw the inundation of the United States with drugs. You saw a massive inundation of drugs. This was when I was in college. I watched this. From the time I entered college, there were no drugs on our campuses. By the time I ended, there were drugs everywhere between 63 and 67. The, the entire nation was shoved into a massive uh, drug-infested hell, which is now so bad that a DEA report just last week indicated that we are in the worst heroin epidemic in the history of America. In our rural communities, one out of ten citizens of the city of Baltimore are on heroin. This is a horrendous situation. Now, also in the 60s, you saw the beginning of the so-called ecological movement. Amongst the drug-infested hippies, you began to see people turning against science, against technology, and accepting the kind of ideology that Dr. Beiser just basically showed was totally fraudulent, where you can get somebody like Al Gore simply lying uh, and being pumped out by all the media, by the, uh, by the, uh, the as you know, the movie theaters who produced this stuff. Uh, this was a very conscious operation. You may know that in America they talk about the British invasion, where they mean the, the invasion of rock and roll from England, the Beatles and the Stones. Uh, well, it was a British invasion, and it did include the introduction of rock music to destroy the classical music culture that still existed in America and is now practically dead amongst our youth. When you go to a concert in America today to see Beethoven or an opera, there's barely anybody under 50 years old. The general culture in America is undergoing a horrendous cultural decay. I'm sure this is equally true in Europe and Canada. Uh, and it's not accidental. It's not just that it happened that way. Popular opinion is unfortunately the bane of civilization. Uh, accepting, if it's popular opinion, it's almost guaranteed that it's wrong. And we have a moment where true thinking people who have the courage to stand up against popular opinion, and Dr. Biden doesn't want to talk about his, the politics of his life, but here's a great scientist who the reason he complains about being thrown out and stuff is that he's been thrown out of various institutions. He's been told that his ideas are no longer wanted because they don't go along with the popular opinion, the zeitgeist. This is dictatorial policy making, anti-scientific uh, policy making, which has taken over. And again, it goes right back to what I said before. All of this stuff is an excuse to implement policies that are being implemented for totally other reasons. When you have a total breakdown of the financial system, the banking institutions that unfortunately run our governments today want to convince people that we simply can't invest in the future anymore. We don't have the resources and it's, uh, it's going to destroy the, of the, the planet because of global warming or so on and so forth. This is the way they have brainwashed the population. And I think that's a legitimate word to use. Because it's basically breaking down the creative power of somebody to think on their own and to be popular rather than to be right. Rather than to be a creative scientist, you want to get along, uh, go along to get along. And this is what has to be broken today. And uh, as I said, I would disagree with Dr. Weiser only in the sense that by taking on the political fight, we can and we must hold up the kind of scientific truth that he just presented to a population that's been inundated with this garbage so that they ask exactly the question that the lady from Indonesia asked just now. Why is it that this rings so true when you hear it? And yet, we never see it on our TV, we never read it in the newspapers. Why? And that is the question people have to ask. Are we going to simply accept popular opinion, or are we going to think for ourselves? And this is, uh, this is a moment where the fate of mankind literally depends on getting a population at large, especially when you have a situation like in the US where the Congress itself is so corrupt 
not in the sense that they're putting money in their pocket. But to win a race in America, you need lots and lots of money, and it comes from Wall Street. So they don't fight. Now, there are those who are fighting. There's some people who have courage. But by and large, you get nothing out of your leadership until we can change that popular opinion into becoming creative thinking in the population of our nation and in Europe and, and in the rest of the world. You want to say something? Uh, just a, a minor point. On the Paris conference in particular, I mean, what they want is a treaty. They want a new international legally binding agreement. That, that is by no means guaranteed. There might, there might be some agreements general agreements to say we'll try and do certain things, but the issue with being an actual legally binding treaty, which they haven't had since Kyoto, is very much up in the air. Um, John Kerry in the United States has already stated that he does not think that a legally binding treaty will be agreed to, uh, which prompted quite a large freak out from some other people uh, for him daring to say that, but that's kind of the reality that many people recognize. Um, India, among <clears throat> the G77 more broadly, has uh, basically declared that, that as things are being pushed, they're not willing to go along with the whole program. Now, obviously, there's a lot of maneuvering going on behind the scenes this week uh, leading up to the conference. Actually, adopting a full treaty is very much not settled. Not It's, 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 it's an open fight at this point right now, it's not clear. Um, you know, this is what they failed to do in 2009, <clears throat> the Copenhagen Conference, <clears throat> when the Queen of England herself came out in the lead up to it, trying to rally the entire Commonwealth to come in, put the weight of the British Empire in on this thing, and get an actual legally binding treaty. It failed there, and it's very much looking like it could be the same thing again here. Uh, but we don't know. There's a lot of pressure going on, a lot of arm twisting uh, leading into this thing. <clears throat> so I would just add that on the details of the thing. And, and let me add one more thing. Uh, the resistance from India, China, and others it tends to take the form of saying, well, yes, of course, we accept that there's climate change and global warming from carbon, but, you know, the advanced sector nations are the ones who created the problem, and now they're telling us that we can't develop the way they developed because we will be the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, that's a foolish argument. They do it because they think it's practical. The proper argument is what Dr. Weiser just said. Truth. Tell the truth. This is a scam. This is a fraud. The way Dr. Weiser puts it is that we have to have a real scientific debate where all sides are heard. I would add that if all sides are heard, the scam and the fraud of the other side would become self-evident and, 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 uh, and people would accept it and understand it. Uh, even people I know quite well, people in China, other people in Asia, who know that in fact the whole argument is a fraud, nonetheless when they go into these formal diplomatic uh, events, they, they fall into the line of saying, well, yeah, okay, it must be because popular opinion says there's climate change, but we shouldn't be the ones who have to do it. Well, let's if we fight for the truth in this and expose this as a total scientific fraud, then we have the chance of actually defeating it and ending this once and for all. It's what, what Ben went through in his presentation. Understand where this comes from. It doesn't come from science. It comes from the same political institutions who, for their own reasons, want to keep the world in a state of backwardness in order to control it, and want to reduce the world's population as Prince Philip does. That's where it comes from, and that's its intent. So the truth, the truth has to be the, the basis on which we proceed if we're going to succeed in pulling the world out of the crisis it's in. Other questions for Dr. Weiser or for Ben? The answer is no. Okay. The, the models uh, essentially pre, uh, they predict past what will happen. So they are. You, you 
can, uh, for example, say here there might be more drought or more rain, for example, because of El uh, Nino. But that has nothing to do with a model like this one. You see the observation that there is more temperature over the, uh, over the Pacific, so therefore it will come because this is what happened in the past. The yeah. same way as you predict, uh, uh, say, climate in Detroit, uh, the weather forecast is what, what was yesterday in Chicago. Okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, just, uh, just extension of empirical observation. I don't know if this is exactly what you were looking for. Um, as you probably know, there's a horrendous drought in California uh, right now. Um, and one argument that we have made repeatedly is that a program that John Kennedy intended to, to do was something called the North American Water and Power Alliance. It would, would have been the greatest infrastructure project by man at that time. It was very much uh, prepared, ready to go. The idea would be to take the huge amounts of water that drain off into the Arctic uh, in Alaska and uh, in the Yukon, divert a small, relatively small portion of that uh, south through pumps, through something called the Rocky Mountain Trench, a, a 500 mile long trench where you could basically use it as a natural uh, river, and move huge quantities of water down into the Great American Desert. Uh, that project would have doubled the agricultural land in the United States. It would have replenished the Ogallagua, is that the way you pronounce it? The Ogallagua uh, um, Aquifer, which is now collapsing, uh, and would have provided the water needed today in California. Well, in that sense, uh, that drought was manipulated by not advancing, by not doing what we could have done scientifically. So I don't know if I, I'm quite sure there's no way you can just, you know, fool around with the air and create a drought. But in a, in a very real sense, that drought was created by man, not by nature. By our failure to do our God-given duty to be creative human beings who have dominion over nature, as our Bible says. Uh, and by not doing so, we pay the consequences. Did you want to say something about that uh, also, Ben? No, I think that, that, that covers it. I would just add, you know, there's many, and we cover in this special report what, what Mike discussed in the beginning, the, the New Silk Road report. There's many other water projects of similar scale around the world that are just sitting on the books, ready to be implemented. You know, water does not have to be, I mean, the, to, for water to be a critical shortage for mankind just shows you the failure of our current system. You know, there's plenty of water. We can use desalination. We can do certain things to increase rainfall. We can do these kinds of water projects. So if, if, if mankind wished to organize himself to apply the level of science and technology available to them even today, we could solve the world's water problems. The reason why that's not happening is because you have this overarching policy to stop development, limit development, you know, the same people, the World Wildlife Fund is incredibly active in stopping water projects, saying you're gonna, you're gonna damage some tadpole somewhere or something, therefore this whole region is gonna be left, you know, to suffer horrendous conditions because of some crazy uh, fraudulent concern they bring up. So again, you know, the underlying issue is this Malthusian ideology. They want to stop development. They don't want nations to develop their resources, to grow, to become more prosperous. That's their motivation, and they come up with all of these excuses as just that, as excuses. So water most of the whole planet is water. There's plenty of water. We can develop the water sources. We have the technology to do it. It's a question of whether we can uh, win this fight and go with the type of program that the BRICS nations, that China is leading, to actually get a new level of international cooperation premised on development. Not zero growth, not population reduction, but development, infrastructure, technology, nuclear power, expansion. You know, if we, if we go with that paradigm, we can solve all these issues. There is a chapter in the new Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge report 
on a project to move water from the Congo River north and replenish Lake Chad, which, as I'm sure you know, has basically disappeared. It's gone. Uh, one of the large, uh, one of the major reasons for the extreme poverty in that entire region is the, uh, the, the, the drying up of that lake. And yet there's huge amounts of water going through the Congo that drains out into the ocean unused. Uh, that water can be used along the way with new water projects and dams, but a certain portion of it, if it would divert it through a project that's already on the books, which known, we know how to do it. Uh, we could uh, basically move that water north and, and again, like in America where we could double the agriculture area, we could begin to green the deserts again. You want to? Yeah. Well, Indonesia is a very classic case, as a matter of fact. You know, um, <clears throat> Sukarno, one of the great leaders uh, in, in World War, the World War II period in, in, in creating independence, as he did, uh, the founder, a uh, key founder of what's called the Non-Aligned Movement now, the uh, spirit of Bandung in 1955. Uh, and then Sukarno was overthrown by John Foster Dulles, by the British, who orchestrated a coup. Uh, and led to the horrible slaughter of the followers of Sukarno, who were all accused of being communists. And you had then, under the Suharto regime, for many years, a lot of development. Um, there was a lot of investment. But, as I'm sure you know, it was almost all resource extraction. It was all mines. A lot of money. So there was money to go around, and there was some development, and the standard of living increased. But, as we learned in 1997 and 98, during the so-called Asian crisis, when all of a sudden George Soros and his friends forced the devaluation of your currency threefold, threefold, all of a sudden the debts that you would accumulated were going to cost you three times more in rupiah to repay, even though it was the same country from one day to the next but the currency had been destroyed, and all of a sudden you had to pay three times more for every penny of your debt. You had taken energy contracts that built energy plants, but you were told you had to sell the energy in dollars, not in rupees. So all of a sudden, you had to pay these energy companies three times more for the energy, overnight, for no reason of anything done by, by Indonesia. And this was the answer to your question. It seems like they don't want these countries to become industrial nations. You're absolutely right. They want to be able to get your gold and copper, they want to get your oil, and they want to get it cheap, and they want to load you up with debt, which is a means of control by the British Empire and their New York friends. Uh, and that's why I showed you that map of Africa, and it's of course, just as true of other countries. The difference is what we have to have, what the BRICS are committed to, and what we have to bring America back to is that this idea of developing nations as true partners, who of course will benefit us in the long run if they're developed nations, if they have industry, if we can trade, if we can have cultural and technological exchanges. But the problem is exactly what you said. We allow financial interests to take over our governments, and the financial interests were only concerned about the immediate short-term return profits any way they can. And when it was no longer profitable to build infrastructure, they stopped building infrastructure. When it was no longer profitable to build industry, they stopped building industry. And our economy has now become an entire gambling casino. I mean, the whole world financial system until this BRICS thing began to pull together their own financial systems through the AIIB and through the, the New Development Bank. Before that, when everything was run by the so-called Washington Consensus and the IMF and the World Bank, it had become one great big gambling casino. On Wall Street today, I don't know the exact number, but it's approximately 90% of the transactions are no longer even buying and selling stock, ownership, and companies. 
It's pure derivative gambling, perhaps even more than that. It's just speculating on where prices will be in the future, on where interest rates will be in the future. Bets, literally placing bets. And when the bets went bad in 2007 and 8, instead of writing, uh, basically allowing these banks to go bankrupt with their bad debts, the government stepped in and bailed them out, printed money to the tune of trillions of dollars, trillions, bailing out banks while nations, including our own, went into economic tailspin. So it is a matter of keeping the third world backward. But I would correct one thing, which is that this is not only the third world. The financial oligarchs are just as committed to the destruction of our nation as we can see today in Europe, where Europe is just being torn to pieces in Greece, in, in Portugal, in Italy, in Spain, Ireland. So this is a global issue, and it's one that uh, your, your question is right. And you're absolutely right about what's been done to your country and others. But its solution has to be global. Or Ben, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I mean, it, more details could be said. And I think that covers it pretty well. I mean, I, maybe do you want to say something on coming back to the situation with Obama and Russia? Just I think that's it's appropriate. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think. Okay. I don't think we need to go back over it. It's clear, I think, that we're on, we're we're at a turning point in history, sometimes called the punctus saliens, a moment at which things are going to go one way or the other. And you know, it's good to be alive at this time in history. Uh, we have something. At, at a moment like this, people can accomplish much more than they could when people are sort of self-satisfied. They think that everything's going to keep going along. Increasingly. Almost everybody in the world recognizes there's something horribly wrong in the world today. And that is a, an opportunity for the truth to assert it. And that's our organization from the very beginning. I remember when I first met Mr. LaRouche, he said, we're not going to, this was back in 1971, he said, we're not going to be very popular. You might be one or two people who care. Everybody else says, oh, it's not going to be as bad as you say. But when it gets as bad, as we've warned. That's the moment at which you have an opportunity to actually change history. And that is this moment.